This team makes one push at the imperative in this debate, and that is to suggest that the Republican Party lacks some level of information or understanding about Trump's policies, whether they're popular, whether Trump himself is popular, that the party doesn't know at this stage whether Trump or DeSantis would be a better candidate for them. But the problem for them is that the writing is very close on the wall and we set it up at, at Tom's speech to no real response. We give you a series of points about the context and the knowledge that the party has. That is to say that all of the candidates that Trump endorsed in the midterms did exceptionally badly, far worse than they were predicted to do. That is to say that Trump already lost to Joe Biden and clearly cannot win those types of races. Like we already have that evidence and it is true. The second, the third thing to say is that the United States is one of the most well-funded electoral systems in the world. Like the industry of electioneering in the United States states is incredibly wealthy and that means that what you end up with is a tremendous number of polls there is a new poll usually several new polls released every single week in the u.s indicating the relative support of a number of different plausible candidates there are focus groups being done constantly the media does this very frequently and of course if there was some sort of bit of information that you lacked after all of this you could as the republican party simply do a poll or a survey or a focus group you did not need to like remain neutral on or possibly support Trump's primary campaign in order to get this information, which means that their imperative and the problem that they point out simply does not exist in this debate. And they do not succeed in proving why it is that you need Trump to specifically run in the primaries, why you shouldn't oppose him doing so. I don't think that that means, I think that means that they're not uh, able to get particularly far in this debate. What do we defend instead? Obviously, there's an extent to which we hope that we can stop Trump from campaigning in the first place. And there are reasons why he would. He is old. He is in bad health. He is already struggling to gain any sort of support. The media is already turning against you. All of that context we give you at Tom, again, to no response from this team, which suggests that he is in a position of weakness. And it would be relatively easy for the Republican Party and likely his family, who are probably concerned about his health and the way that doing another long two-year campaign would probably put an enormous amount of physical and mental stress upon him and hurt him, like it would be pretty reasonable and pretty easy to give him an out here. And the out is just roll back the campaign, don't do it, wait a year, say nothing, let it just fade away, and then endorse Ron DeSantis gracefully and step out. Perhaps they allow him to speak at some rallies in particularly conservative areas or deep red states so that he can still, you know, have some level of public profile and enjoy that aspect, but he does not need to be the candidate. And I think it is incredibly plausible that he would take that option. But even if he doesn't take that option, then we give you a second mechanism by which we can just get him out of this race relatively quickly. And that's to say that Tom explains that, that Trump is incredibly likely to lose Iowa to Ron DeSantis because of the fact that Trump's policy is incredible, ho incredibly hostile to things like exporting corn or, or producing more ethanol and exporting that. That means that it is really easy to suggest that after Iowa, you would again go to Trump and say, hey, look, you've already lost the first state in the primary, just concede endorse DeSantis. You will be a part of this party. We will give you some level of public platform. We will give you some level of respect. Obviously, that is incredibly reduced compared to what he would get as the nominee. And realistically, those promises probably just never get fulfilled because he is old, because he is frail, because he is in bad health. This is something you say to him that he is unlikely to actually be able to follow through on anyway, but it gets him out of the race quickly. Why is getting him out of the race the most important imperative in this debate? The, under the thing that you need to understand is that the longer that Trump stays in the public profile, the longer that he is campaigning in the primary, the more that he is able to waste resources as Republican candidates are forced to spend money to campaign against Trump when otherwise they could just be building their own support. The more that he wastes the resources of the party to the extent that he has access to them, the resources of donors who would otherwise be able to direct them to a single candidate who could use them on the farm more important general election stage, and the more that he's able to do things like create problems for the Republican Party, like create other violent riots, like create other gaffes, like say things that are widely reviled and hated, the more that he's able to destroy the credibility of the Republican Party and turn away donors, turn away the types of people who do do the focus groups and do the electioneering, the experts and the consultants that the Republican Party relies upon to understand policies, to understand voters and to form the policies that they want. All of that means that the longer he sticks around, the harder it is for the Republican Party to access and use resources in a way that is effective. That is unbelievably bad for them. And obviously, the more that he's able to just depress turnout by rallying support to some extent, even though he does likely lose at the end of those primaries or loses eventually, the more that he's able to create the kind of divisiveness and rhetoric that makes maybe means that Republicans just don't turn out for DeSantis at all, and then they're completely ruined for the election. So that is unbelievably bad for them and means that they end up just kind of like chaining themselves to something that is not helpful, will not win them that general. That is really bad for them. Let's talk a little bit more about 2024. The first thing to say here is just that like, 
I just think it's kind of really easy to believe that Trump doesn't want to do this or will not want to do this in a year. He's old, he's low energy, he's already failing, give him a graceful out. Like it is just highly likely at this point in the debate that our opposition as the RNC is successful. This team has given you almost like, like actually no reason to believe that we would not succeed. So it's standing and it's standing powerfully at this point in the debate. Compare Trump though to Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis, we again explained to you at Trump, he's young, he's vital, he will actually survive a primary reliably. No Nobody is going to be concerned that his like VP candidate is going to end up assuming the presidency, which is a very real concern that Trump will have to deal with. And note that that will be quite difficult for him because it will be difficult for Trump to find somebody willing to be his VP after the way that he was with Pence, right? Like, even if you agree with Trump, you probably don't want to do this job because he was so unbelievably abusive. You have to be around the guy the whole time and he's controlling and he's like starting to probably go a bit senile. He's probably just an unbelievably unpleasant candidate and you get no real benefit out of it, which means that it's likely Trump is going to not be able to find a good VP candidate and will be stuck with somebody who sucks. That's going to be an enormous problem. By comparison, DeSantis does not have that problem. DeSantis can do the types of things that are valuable that Trump can do. He can trigger the left. He can rely upon culture war narratives. He has done it to enormous success. And DeSantis is favored by the media. The media is already pushing him forward as the most credible alternative, whereas the media is increasing recently turning against Trump because of the fact that his endorsements seemed to really hurt the Republican Party in the midterms meant that they could not hold on to those down ballot races. Let's then talk about down ballot races in 2024. This is another argument that we give you at Trump, uh, that we give you, sorry, that we give you at Tom, uh, uh, that we give you at Tom uh, to no real response. Uh, and that is to say that this matters tremendously. This is obviously just clearly within the motion. Like the motion doesn't specify, it just says electoral interest. It doesn't say presidential election. So the motion implies president, like that state-based races imply are matter, matter tremendously as well. But also the states are usually some of the more impactful actors when it comes to actually enacting ideology and enacting policy in the United States. So much power is devolved down to them, which means that if you're a Republican candidate, like a Republican party who cares about, you know, ideology, who cares about making things more business friendly, deregulation, whatever, all of that is often done through the states. And it is really important to do things like be able to generate new leaders by getting them things like governorships so that they can develop experience and a public profile and lead your party into the future. This is unbelievably important. And if you have Trump and he's still endorsing people, they will just consistently lose by the precedent of the last election, whereas DeSantis is more likely to get better candidates who can actually win. That means that you can loop in sponsorship at the state level and funnel it up to the federal party, which is able to then make sure that you do a better job at that general election. Last thing to talk about very briefly is 2028. Even if our worst case happens, Trump somehow still wins and you lose in 2024, opposing him in 2024 is really important because it means that the Republican Party can start to shake off that shackle of Trump over the next four years because it is able to start to purge staffers because it's able to make it clear that this is not a Trump-friendly environment. That means that you can start to rebuild those old relationships with donors that turned away from you because of the public backlash that Trump generated. You can start to rebuild relationships with consultants and experts who can help you win in 2024, and you can start to get more moderate politics and better candidates for that election in 2028. This got these this team stops that from happening and drags out the time lag far longer. So because we get you the better chance in 24 and in 28, proud to affirm. I think that I can be heard. Even if you buy that for some reason the Republicans can't just hold or look at the results of a nationwide poll right now to discover how popular Trump truly is, it's incredibly unclear from the negative team at the end of those two speeches what the actual impact of that is on the electoral landscape and on the electoral interests of the Republican Party. Because they tell you you get this nuance in policy, but they don't ever respond to the mechanisms we give you as to why Ron DeSantis is an incredibly or much more electable policy in the first place. And they just assume that people vote about uh, on policy when we give you mechanisms that explain why people are actually influenced by many other things in the electoral sphere. So it is incredibly unclear why the benefit they try to claim, which is essentially that you're able to create more nuanced policy that perhaps appeals to more people, is not also claimed by us talking about Ron DeSantis winning the election in any way if he is the person chosen by the primaries. And in that instance, you don't also have to suffer the potential uh, loss that is likely to occur to the Republican Party if Trump is the primary candidate again. But note that even in their best case, then they still lose the stuff that we explained to you about 
down ballot voting and why the Republicans are much less likely to be successful in the House and Senate in that. So even in their absolute best case scenario where they win the thing that they really want to prove, they still lose the debate. Okay, moving on from that stuff about like information and I'll engage with it a little bit more in the in the, like in my next issue as to why that's like unlikely to have the same change on electoral incentives as they were but just to talk about why it is true that Trump will not win this and why that is why this primary and why it is incredibly important because they try to suggest to you today that Trump still has a very large group of supporters that we will alienate and will not be able to kind of be represented in the policy that the Republican Party takes to the election. But I would just kind of note that they never actually prove that the preferences of voters in the Republican parties are completely unchanging and are just set at this particular point in time, which I think is incredibly important, right? Because when Tom and Jordan tell you about the fact the media landscape has changed significantly since 2020 and 2016, the only year in which Trump was actually elected, that's incredibly important because a lot of people find it very difficult to do nuanced political research on their own, right? They're not having multiple subscriptions to different papers from different political viewpoints. They're probably turning on the news, maybe Fox News or another ideological news source that they prefer to watch and seeing what perspective that news is selling to them. And of course, they support Trump at the point at which Fox News has been his lapdog for the past six years. But when Mur Rupert Murdoch, who owns, the, like, I think it's almost a majority of media in the US, says that he will not support Donald Trump if he is the Republican's primary candidate and will find another way to kind of, or like, you know, a way to actively disavow him if he is elected. People will not support Donald Trump at the point in time that is their only main source of media. But it's also wh why when the Republican Party now goes towards painting Trump as relatively old and flips their kind of campaigning on Biden, it's incredibly convincing because people have already been primed to think that being old is a sign that you cannot be a good president. And they will think the same thing of Donald Trump as well. He's also just less able to do things like in 2016, where he holds massive rallies and has high energy because he is just getting older and less enthusiastic about the whole thing. The next thing to note, though, is to remember that Donald Trump actively alienates voters, including Republicans. Republicans, because when he was president, he, despite saying he wanted to do things like save American jobs and stuff like that, he also supported policies that were incredibly unstable for the American people. So, for example, the trade war with China that occurred, which screws over America's economy because it limits its ability to provide exports to the biggest import market in the world, aside from the US, of course. Obviously, these things mean that Trump is just less and less popular amongst people who are everyday voters. But the final thing we would note is that DeSantis can capture people with the culture war stuff that he does, like the Don't Say Gay Bill in Florida, that Trump supporters love in the first place. But he was also likely to capture the people who were like never Trump voters from the past because he didn't have the same uh, divisive language that Trump used in the first place. He was a lot more electable by a lot more spheres. This is incredibly important because their case is predicated on this idea that Trump is a big proportion of the electoral landscape. That does not have to be that way forever. The Republican Party is a massive committee. They have a huge amount of money and fundraising to push whatever message they want. At the point at which we give you all of these structural mechanisms as to why it's effective, it shouldn't matter to you whether Trump is like a popular candidate now. What matters is that he won't be a popular candidate by the time that 2024 comes around and most Republicans will be satisfied with Ron DeSantis there. And notably as well, that when Trump runs a stronger primary campaign than he would have under our world, you notably pay much less attention to the policies of any other candidate in the Republican Party that is running against him, because Trump looks like and has, you know, I guess, a lot of perhaps residual political pull. And that means then if you buy their mechanism that nuanced policy is the best thing, you cannot engage with the nuanced policy that may come out of alternative Republican candidates at the same time. At the end of this, it is just deeply unclear why it is important that you get more of this like information in the first place and like explain why that doesn't have an impact on elections in the future but also that even if trump is popular in the world in which the republican party uh, like supports him or doesn't oppose him we can make him less popular in the world in which we oppose him therefore getting around their win condition in the first place okay secondly then talking about how this affects electoral outcomes remember that their best case scenario is they get information but note that in this world they have to potentially deal with the poten deal with the possibility that trump might win that election making an incredibly unpopular republican candidate lose the general election which is obviously against the incentives of the republican party's electoral instance let's take their perhaps slightly better case scenario right where Ron DeSantis wins but they get this all this information on Trump one thing that they one th uh, on Trump which is just incredibly unclear why you need this information to be nuanced in terms of how like the party actually works in like uh, this nuance about policy in the first place at the point at which then you already have a majority of people within the Rep Republican Party voting for DeSantis 
And we already explained that the fact that DeSantis can play into some of the cultural stuff, like taxing Gizzy or doing things that conservatives like to do to trigger the left, um, are just not things that people would presumably also support under there. They also don't explain why those people won't turn out in the instance in which Trump is not on the ballot paper. But also note that the Trump being in the primaries is something that is incredibly important to Democrats in terms of turning them out in these elections. So the point at which you have a really strong primary campaign that is really close between Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump, even if Ron DeSantis wins, you probably still have the residual fear from Democrats that Donald Trump is gaining power in the American political system. And thus you probably have similar campaigns for trying to get people out to vote. If you can really push Donald Trump down and have, I guess, more low-key alternative, you don't have that same kind of push to turn out to turn out to vote. At the point at which we think DeSantis will win anyway, though, this of course destroys their imperative. And DeSantis will win because he's ideologically closer to the average American citizen. So it doesn't really matter whether or not his policy is particularly nuanced because most people don't give a shit about policy. It's also because you get significantly more fundraising under our side of the house. At the point at which you get rid of Trump, the liability, you have more businesses more willing to engage with the Republican Party again in a way they haven't been willing to do while he's been a stain on the party in the past. But also, of course, again, when you get more media support for a candidate that is more moderate, they are more likely to win the election as well. So even if you have all of their information, which you can obviously get elsewhere, it still means that it doesn't change anything about the debate. But what does change in this debate is how down ballot races play out. This is incredibly important because the Republican Party signals candidates to disalign from Trump if they've already aligned from with him or to not align with him at all in 2024, which is, of course, very easy for candidates to choose to do. There's a lot of runway between now and the next election in two years to choose how they want to align. And what that means is you no longer have Trump having, I guess, nominations where candidates win primary seats for the House and go on to be incredibly uh incredibly ineffective candidates in the general house elections but you have people who are nominated by DeSantis or who are endorsed by DeSantis DeSantis, and you have people who have been like signaled to try and stay a little bit more moderate, which means the Republicans do significantly better on the down ballot than they would otherwise. And obviously, this is probably most important for Republicans. Even if they lose the general election, they do better in the House and Senate, meaning they actually have the real power over legislation. At the end of this debate, the only thing that they can win on is proving they get more information that is ineffectual and it does nothing to prove why like they'll actually win elections. So proud to uh, propose. I mean that I'm audible. At best implicit throughout the first two speeches of that negative team and finally made explicit in the dying moments of third negative is what they seem to rely on to win this debate, which is a claim that in order to oppose Trump, we must radically change policies and we must oppose them. This claim is unbelievably unproven. It is asserted in the last seconds of their negative, and it is completely unresponsive to the detailed descriptions of what this opposition looks like that we give you in Tom's speech and again in mine. We do not need to oppose Trump's policy. We need to oppose Trump. And we give him several outs on why he can just let the campaign die, move on, endorse DeSantis. And that is material that is given to you down our bench. And we only get a response at literally seven minutes and 50 seconds of the third negative. That response is asserted. It is not enough to overcome the detail that we give you down our speech. Let's talk then about more information and whether or not it is a good in this debate. The first thing to suggest is that this team doesn't ever at, at does not ever describe in concrete terms how they want to use the additional information that they get from what is a single poll, which is the primary. They don't explain what they would change policy to beyond using the word nuance a lot without explaining what that means. But we explain we can take the shortcut. Ron DeSantis's policy is already more nuanced. It is already more popular. Stuff like the 15 week abortion ban that, that Tom tells you about gets no response in this debate. I suspect that what they want to do is just do this poll, do this primary and do no change to DeSantis's policy or to Trump's for that matter. It doesn't make sense in this debate. But we also explained to you that there is just no real informational gap anyway. This team is like Trump can be unpredictable, but not that unpredictable. And even if he is, it's unpredictable clear to, to me why allowing him to run in the primary gives you information that makes him unpredictable because we already know what Trump does in office. He was in office for four years. We know what he does in general elections. He ran in two of them. And we know how his endorsements play out when it comes to his down ballot candidates. They lose. They lose. They lost epically in the midterms. We tell you that again down the bench. And the best response that we get is just a suggestion that like, well, the Republicans still have the Senate. So like, it's not that bad. <laughs> 
completely ungrounded in reality and does not make any sense. The final thing to suggest though, is weigh off the information that they get from one source, which is the primary, against the material we give you at second, when we explain that Trump's, that Trump's rhetoric and Trump's presence means that you lose the ability to attract experts, pollsters, focus group managers, and other electioneering professionals. That means that these guys get a small amount of worthless information in the short term, and they trade it off against the ability to gather far more useful information over the long term into the future, which means I think even by the metric of information, they lose for that reason. Let's finally talk about relative electability. This team does not actually at any point make a positive push on why Trump is more electable than DeSantis. They just make some claims as to why he is not unelectable and why he still has some people who might support him. The lack of comparison here, I think, means, again, that these claims ought be discredited and largely ignored. But the second thing to say here is that the claims that they do make are just rebutted by reality. They're like Republicans love political, uh, they love tradition. They don't like change. They want consistency within the Republican Party. You have to ask yourself why they voted for Trump in 2016, if that's true. Like, it's just, it's just ungrounded. Like, reality literally contradicts this on such an epic scale that I just think that these fail the basic test of what the average intelligent voter believe that this could be true. They would not. They would dismiss it as, as just being ungrounded in reality. The last thing to say is weigh that against the material we give you around Ron DeSantis, who has policy that is largely similar, but more nuanced, who is able to have better health and a relatively younger age, who can survive this campaign, who has control over Florida, who does not push away traditional donors and traditional voters and sources of expert information in the way that Trump does, who has existing media support, who has an existing profile from the way that he's leveraged off of, of culture wars issues in Florida, who can do a far better job at picking and endorsing down ballot candidates. We win this debate very clearly. So I'll start with a general point of feedback, which I think will frame my adjudication as well, um, which is that uh, a lot of the points in this debate weren't necessarily directly engaged with. So there's a lot of breadth in this debate that kind of goes unchallenged, maybe from both sides, uh, which means that I'll be talking about how those points interact and not necessarily all the details that go in that point. So I guess the point of feedback from that is that in certain instances, it's fine to reshape strategy so you don't necessarily have to deal or, or, or respond to some of the framing and mechanisms from either team. Uh, but in some instances, it is necessary and very useful to do so. So keep a lookout for that in future debates, I guess. So I gave, we gave this debate as a panel unanimously by a pretty clear margin to the affirmative team. So congratulations to ANU and commiserations at NEO. Uh, and the reason for it as, is, is as follows. So uh, the broad metric of this debate as given by the motion is what is in the electoral interests of the Republicans. Uh, and there are two parts of this as brought up uh, uh, in this debate. Firstly, in terms of the directly winning in 2024. Uh, and, and then secondly, other instances of uh, control for the Republican Party. So down ballot elections provided by side affirmative and about endorsed candidates that already exist that now are tainted by the, I guess, the opposition to Trump. Um, I'm just going to deal with the down ballot election stuff uh, first. Obviously, it's less important than directly winning uh, the presidential election. You get way more power in that instance, but I'm just going to explain this as a margin building uh, point as well. So I think what we hear from side affirming uh, right from the start is that down ballot elections matter a lot uh, and they impact that well by pointing to the devol dev devolved power that's given to states and creating policy there uh, and point to some examples as to where the Republican Party is kind of doing this uh, out of the federal system and getting that policy and ideology pushed through there. The and I think that just not as that's not responded to from side negative. So I think side affirming is able to prove that um, down ballot elections will be picked badly by Trump, and in fact will be better under any other candidate. But they point to Ron DeSantis. Um, from side negative, uh, it's not a direct clash, but it's hard to kind of clash things in this debate uh, to that extent. Uh, they talk about how when you lose Trump, you lose the uh, endorse the endorsed uh, candidates by Trump and you lose, I guess, a platform for them, but you also taint them and their supporters uh, might get turned off, those kinds of things. The 
reason why I uh, I thought that wasn't necessarily persuasive as persuasive as the down ballot elections is that firstly I don't I think it's relatively short term and and uh, AF points to I guess long term problems with Trump uh, be having control over that kind of selection but also the framing that's provided to us and, and is something that a re an average reasonable voter would know which is that Trump's candidates have failed in the midterms and that was brought up by side affirming several times and with that context it's unclear as to how many of those endorsed candidates exist. And if, why that amount is going to be sufficiently enough to overcome the benefits that we are already discussed from side affirming. So I think side affirming wins that point. And while it's not as important, I just want to get that out of the way. That does increase the margin for them uh, after we deal with this second clash here. So the second clash is about winning in 2024. And I want to discuss information here. So I think there are a couple of things that come out from this information point from side negative. Um, and and the, the response we hear from side affirming is that it's unclear what the information will do. Uh, uh, you're not necessarily going to be able to create nuanced policy. What does a nuanced policy look like? And even if you did want to do that, you have other options like polling. And while side negative provides some reasons as to why the direct election might be better than polling, it's unclear as to why it's so much better that you get a, a huge increase in knowledge and information that allows you to create nuanced policy that again lets you win the election. Secondly, obviously provided by side affirming is that that information kind of can't be used in a, in a way because the information you get from it is whether Ron uh, DeSantis wins or whether Trump wins the primary. But I think that is part of side negatives claim here. And I want to credit that in terms of what the the, the best form of that argument is, which is that, uh, as I negative says this explicitly at some point as well, that it's better to let Trump run. And if he wins, then that is good. And you are not able to even get that option if you oppose Trump and convince him to step down. And therefore, you're stuck with Ron DeSantis or whoever wins and you don't get the option of Trump. I think that's a good point, uh, but I think it's dealt with by side affirming uh, indirectly in several ways. So the first is that even if Trump wins the primary, uh, side affirming gives several reasons as to why Trump is likely to be unpopular in a general election and might still lose to the, Dem the Democrats slash Biden. Uh, and specifically, side affirming gives reasons as to why Ron DeSantis, their chosen uh, candidate, is specifically better than the Democrats weaponizing, uh, I guess, a bit of ageism and how old candidates are uh, and pointing to things like how the tide is turning in other uh, sectors against Trump. So how Fox News and the, uh, other media sources are necessarily against Trump, that might not be the case for uh, Ron DeSantis. So I think even in the instance where Trump is uh, successful and not a loser and a failure and is able to beat Ron DeSantis and get the benefit, I think that side negative is trying to claim here. Side affirming has shown why that might that might not be a good thing in a general election when you're compared against the Democrats. The second thing that the side affirming says here is that you might lose other support from that. You lose pollsters, you lose, I guess, the, the bureaucratic structure around that, you lose donors. So there are harms, even if you know you get a chance of having Trump there for letting for the for the Republican Party not opposing Trump. So that point I think there means that side affirming side negative doesn't necessarily give more options to the Republican Party that is necessarily good because there's a chance that even if Trump wins, that might not be good for the Republican Party's electoral chances in 2024. But the second question that comes after this is whether Trump is better than Ron DeSantis, right? And so the idea here is whether Trump can win. And if you push Trump out, does that change then the ability for Republicans to campaign? Uh, and this is the whole voter base and the rhetoric that is used. So in, whether Trump's a loser or a, or a winner, we hear from side affirming, uh, I think, right from first, aff uh, first, first affirming, quite a few reasons and pointing to, I guess, the current situation in the US with data from the midterms, but also uh, analysis of changing viewpoints that I've already mentioned in terms of the media as to why Trump is likely not going to be successful or comparatively not going to be as successful as Ron DeSantis, who has had success. Um, I think similarly, Nick points to historical data about Trump being a winner, but it does seem with the framing brought up from side affirming that the historical data actually points the other way to Trump being a loser. And this is like the intuition pump part of the argument. Uh, I think side affirming uh, is more, uh, I'm already predisposed to believe side affirming given the, the framing and context that's set up by them. But let's look at the argumentation that's brought from either side. So we hear a couple of things from side negative. The first is that Traditionalist Republicans don't like a change. So even if 
Ron DeSantis is more popular or has better policy or whatever, they won't like the change there. And I think the first problem with that, I think, is this idea of the implicit assumption from side negative that you aren't able to get the same kinds of policy when you don't have Trump. Uh, and I think that misses the the way that was uh, side affirming set up this opposition that it's not necessarily against the policies from Trump, but it's it's against Trump as a person. And I think that reflects a lot in their analysis of why Ron DeSantis is a better candidate is that they're not necessarily going to be uh, different in terms of still going to do the things like the don't say gay bill in Florida or and still do things like baiting uh, libs on Twitter, those kinds of things, and are able to get that same level of rhetoric, but doesn't have to be the failures of Trump, where Trump is more unpredictable, is older, and that's all the reasons, again, I'm not going to get into, but the reasons given as to why Trump's less successful than Ron it aren't reasons as to why policy would be different from them. So I'm re relatively convinced that there might be similar sorts of policy. There's a second level here about elitism uh, and, and I guess protectionism, which I think is confusing uh, on side affirming side, because I think at some one point we hear that Ron DeSantis is likely to foster trade for ethanol. And then we hear that they're likely to be protectionist about ethanol. It's unclear as to what, or, or, or like in terms of like what the groups of people that Ron DeSantis will be catering to would want compared to, you know, the more protectionist anti-elite messaging from Trump. But I don't think that is necessarily so different that you're going to get that level of change that is going to harm traditionalists. Obviously, also, I am unclear as to how traditionalist Republicans are with the intuition pump from F reply that they literally changed their old, the old GOP way, way to go with Trump as well. But what I think that means there is in terms of popularity, side negative claims that there is a significant proportion uh, and a large voter base that is is going to be uh, is going to be supporting Trump. Now, the harm, the problem with the, the negative claims argument there that there is this large group of people is side affirming says that they're able to unlock other groups of people that have currently been turned off Trump. So unlock, unlock other donors. So if, even if you lose resources from not having Trump, it's unfair how much comes from Trump's. The, the, the neg team just says that there are resources that come from Trump, but it's unclear then as well whether that's not balanced off by the amount of new donors that I think side affirming takes a lot of time to frame as to why Trump turns those individuals off. Similarly, uh, with the discussion of policy, uh, it's unclear as to why that large group of voters that voted for Trump cannot be unlocked by uh, Ron DeSantis or any, any other Republican candidate that wins the primary in Trump's absence. The clash then becomes about how Trump deals with this, right? So and uh, there are a couple of problems here. With, so basically what Sai Negative then claims is that that large group of voters might not vote for Ron DeSantis and not because they vote for Trump and now you're opposing Trump. That firstly um, is slightly new, and I think actually I think pretty much very new in, in a, almost like a new substantive argument uh, in terms of how this will harm electoral chances. That comes out very late at the negative, and I think even though it's hinted that there's a large voter base, the important mechanism, which is that Trump will get, be upset about the opposition and therefore. Uh, turn against Republican Party, and that will actually might change electoral incent, uh, electoral results because the large voter base now no longer votes Republican anymore. Uh, is new, and I, I think therefore is under is not credited as much by the panel. The second problem with this argument is that side affirming spends a lot of time carefully framing how they're likely to push Trump out slowly. Uh, and again, this response comes up, uh, and the neighbor it's still a response. But the response is pointing to status quo trends uh, that Trump has is running, even though people don't like Trump, even though he's unpopular. So it's unclear as to why the side negative says why their model and their way of pushing Trump out might would result in Trump doing the thing doing the things that they want to say. And instead, they suggest, as we've already discussed, that Trump will backlash against the Republican Party and harm their electoral success. However. That analysis then, again, doesn't directly clash. There's no way up between those two things, but how side affirming provides those argumentation as to why Trump is less likely or more likely just to fade away nicely, has all these other interests that, that Trump needs to deal with compared to the, uh, uh, the, the, the characterization we get from third negative. Uh, and I think that characterization came out relatively late at third negative. It isn't built up to the extent that I'm convinced that that, that under, undermines or overcomes a lot of the analysis we heard right from first affirming as to why they're able to do subtle things, not necessarily go hard after Trump, but slowly push Trump out. 
even to the extent that that voter base changes, it's unclear again with all the framing that we had from side affirming point to the current electoral failures of Trump endorsed candidates, whether that voter base is large enough then again to overcome all the problems we hear from side affirming. So uh, that clash is rather messy uh, and un un underengaged from both sides, I think, in a direct clash here. But I think that means that at the end of this debate, uh, I'm convinced that Ron DeSantis is more likely to win but also, even if you oppose Trump, Trump is not necessarily going to react the, the way that side negative claims they, that he will react at third neck. But uh, and so therefore, you are not going to necessarily lose a large group of the forever Trumpers, uh, but unlock more voters. And even to that extent, even if it's equal, all the reasons I've provided to you earlier as to why uh, I believe side affirmings claim that Ron DeSantis is a better candidate to run against the Democrats means that there is far greater chance for electoral uh, win inside affirming. And that's why, and that plus the down ballot election stuff I've already discussed uh, means that the panel gave the debate to side affirming by a clear, a relatively clear and large margin.